The hope still lives, and the dream shall never die. After all this time, the foreman of the grand jury in the Chappaquiddick scandal says there was a cover-up. Nobody gave a damn about Mary Jo Kopechny. I did. Until we all know what happened, Mary Jo can never rest in peace. Breaking tonight, the leading candidate to become the new White House Chief of Staff drops out of the race as President Trump prepares for a make-or-break meeting with congressional leaders on funding for the border wall. Evening, everyone, and welcome to The Next Revolution. I'm Steve Hilton, and this is the home of positive populism. Tonight, Chad Pergram is live for us in Washington, and I'm joined here in Los Angeles by Lisa Booth, Frank Buckley, and Kennedy. Also tonight, there you are, I think we needed that little <laughs> cry there. Also tonight, we have the latest on the populist revolution in France and what it means for us here, a new plan to break up big tech, and after General Motors' shocking plant closures, we'll ask if it's time for corporate welfare reform. But first, let's bring in Fox News senior Capitol Hill producer Chad Pergram. Chad, lots going on all weekend long, and it keeps, go <laughs> keeps coming the news. So everyone was saying that after President Trump announced that John Kelly was out. Uh, Nick Ayers, the vice president's chief of staff, was almost certain to get the job, but it turns out that's not the case. Tell us about that. Well, you know, I was getting some hand signals late last week that it, it wouldn't be Ayers or that uh, he might kind of go sideways here. You hear a lot of these things here on Capitol Hill, especially when Capitol Hill players might be the successor. Uh, one name who is part of the administration right now but has a lot of ties to Capitol Hill is Mick Mulvaney. He is the budget director. Of course, he used to be a Republican mm -hmm. congressman from South Carolina and was the co-founder of the Freedom Caucus. The other name that we've been he hearing a little bit about this weekend is Mark Meadows. He's the Republican congressman from North Carolina who kind of co-founded and, and leads the, the, the Freedom Caucus right now. I think that you're going to see an audition in the next few days about this as to maybe who might have the president's back as he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Democrats and even a lot of Republicans on Capitol Hill as they try to keep the government funded come uh, the 22nd of December. That's the deadline when they have to, to fund the government by. A and who is whispering in the president's ear? Uh, who is actually maybe fighting against some, quote, establishment Republicans on Capitol Hill? And if you're someone like Mark Meadows, Maybe it isn't as fun to be in the minority. You know, it's one thing if you're going to be, you know, throwing bombs at the Democrats here, you know, from the minority. But some people think that the Freedom Caucus is weakened in the minority, and all they might do is divide the Republican Party. So, so Mark Meadows might be a player there. Mick Mulvaney has been mentioned mm -hmm. potentially for this job for, for months off and on. So, Chad, tell us about that. I'm interested in your point there about the establishment role here. Last week on Swamp Watch, we did a, an investigation into, into what I described as some of the establishment um, players inside the White House trying to frustrate the president's populist agenda. Um, we got a strong reaction to that. How does this play out? Do you get a sense that there are establishment um, players trying to make sure that their guy or woman gets this job? Well, look at how it could play into the government shutdown question here. If you have a deal that is cut with Democrats and some Republicans that doesn't get the president what he wants, which is ultimately this border wall, or at least isn't something satisfactory uh, what he wants that, that uh, you know, matches his campaign promise, you could see that being a problem. And that's why I describe this as kind of an audition. You know, Stephen Mnuchin, who's the mm -hmm. Treasury Secretary, has been mentioned. The president has tweeted in just the past hour or so that he's interviewing a lot of top people and uh, he hopes to have somebody good. You you know, it wasn't that long ago that Kevin McCarthy, who's going to be the minority leader, was somebody whose name was batted around. But it seems like, uh, you know, that trifecta of Mnuchin, maybe Meadows and maybe Mulvaney, you know, that's, that seems to be the wheelhouse that he's working in right now. And how they deal with Capitol Hill, that's going to be central to the whole thing. God, they can have a lot of reaction if it's Mnuchin, I'll tell you that. Anyway, well, last question, Chad. Just want to um, look ahead to this, this meeting. Are we still expecting this meeting between the president, Nancy Pelosi, and Chuck Schumer on the border wall? And right. the further question that I wanted to ask you is, is and, and forgive me if this sounds like a dumb question, but I know a lot of the audience are asking it. Why do we need congressional approval for this, given that everyone agrees from the president down, that, that certainly on, on his side of the fence, that the situation at the border is a national security issue and the money involved, $5 billion, is actually tiny in comparison to the overall federal discretionary budget, the defense budget, whichever one you want to look at. Why can't he just take the money from the existing defense budget and use that for the wall? 
Well, the founders were very clear when they gave the power of the purse to the legislative branch. They didn't want the executive branch to just take the money willy-nilly and move it around. That's why they put that power with the legislative branch. They have already approved the defense budget uh, for this fiscal year. That was one of the five spending bills which they have approved. And so you can't go back in, you know, ex post facto and say, we're going to move some money from defense and move it over here. One of the seven bills that remains unfunded is the Department of Homeland Security funding bill. And that's where most of the wall money would reside. Now, there's always a little bit of... Uh, of money you can move around behind the scenes. But Congress, you know, has the power of the purse. The founders were absolutely clear about that. They didn't want abuse by the executive. And so if Congress has already appropriated uh, what the Pentagon is getting, you can't say, okay, we're going to move that over to the Department of Homeland Security. Therein lies the problem. And the DHS funding bill is one of the seven that remains outstanding. You're right. This meeting well, is on I've... for Tuesday with uh, Nancy Pelosi mm -hmm. and Chuck Schumer. Uh, don't forget that a year ago, September, it was President Trump. When he met with them, he cut a deal with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer to keep the government open and went over the heads of the Republicans, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan. They're deal makers, and Nancy Pelosi knows that she cannot start being the prospective Speaker of the House on January 3rd with a government shutdown. So she has to deal. One last point, and this is very right. critical. Republicans this past summer on not one but two different occasions defeated, mind you, defeated bills in the House of Representatives which would have provided full funding for the border wall. There is not the right mixture of just Republicans in the House to keep the government open to fund a bill, uh, to, to pass a bill that funds the wall or one that doesn't fund the wall. They need Democratic support, frankly, in both chambers, and it seems like the House of Representatives might be more important considering what the history was on trying to fund the border wall on those two pieces of legislation mm -hmm. this past summer, Steve. Chad, thank you so much for all My of pleasure. that. Um, so much going on. Always great to see you. Appreciate that. Now let's meet our guest here with us tonight, author of the Republican Workers' Party, Frank Buckley, Fox News contributor Lisa Booth, and the host of Kennedy on FBN Kennedy. Do we get another little whoop? Woo! So there you go. Very good. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad we got that. So Lisa, let's let's get Making to this. Sure we're yeah, exactly Sunday night, right. Favorite. Sunday night. So listen, what this this border was. I mean, Chad was laying it all out there. I mean, what Nancy Pelosi has been going around saying that the border wall is immoral. That's the word she was using at the end of last week. What chance is there that if, we, if we're depending on her for this, it's ever going to happen? Well, and, and that's why President Trump, his, really his only window of opportunity to try to get anything done with the wall would be in this lame duck session. He's certainly not going to get it from Nancy Pelosi in a Democrat-controlled uh, House next Congress. So this is his only time why Senator Lindsey Graham has said that, you know, now is the time President Trump needs to dig in on this. And I think what we saw really at the southern border when you had a thousand migrants trying to rush the southern border, a visualization of why the wall is needed, why we need that deterrent. And what I am confused about is if we have 22 million illegal immigrants living here in the United States right now and neither party can figure out what to do with those individuals, why would we not try to stop the flow of additional legal immigrants that we're not going to know what to do with? So I think the, the wall is needed at the southern border, but it's even beyond that. It's also changes to what's mm -hmm. broken with our asylum system, how easy it is to at least pass that initial test. Um, for asylum coming over to the United States and then also laws like the Flores Decree and a 2008 anti-human trafficking law loophole in that. So I think it's even broader than just a wall. It's also trying to get some of these immigration legislative fixes. Yeah, but I mean, good luck with that. I mean, we're going to talk yeah. about the, the, the White House changes and the chief of staff and all of that a bit later. So let's just sort of fo keep, keep it to the, to the wall and the immigration situation for now. I mean, Kennedy, are you excited about the... Chuck and Nancy, round two. It looks like we're getting that this um, week. Chuck is still in the minority, and he, I, I think he's going to be quite envious of Nancy Pelosi because she's in a much greater position of power. Uh, there, there's still so much chaos and discord between the House and the Senate, regardless that's of party. That's a great point. Uh, but they, they both have something the other wants, and, and that's a solution on DACA and the wall. And it's so natural for both sides to come together. And if I were Democrats, I would take the deal because, and I've said this time and time again, and I still believe this with my entire heart and being, that they are going to run into so many eminent domain issues in Texas alone that it is going to be impossible to complete any sort of wall in any short period of time. So Democrats should take the deal and then have a caveat within the legislation, because it, Chad is right, and it is up to the legislature, that if, if if there is, for some reason, a legal holdup, that that money is reappropriated back to another agency, mm -hmm. or better yet, back to the American people. Mm. All right, then there they you get are. Their, they get their their DACA pawn. 
So, Frank, um, yes. you, uh, been, you've been a great sort of advocate um, for what I describe as, in my language, as positive populism, and I think this question of immigration mm -hmm. and the impact of immigration is so central to, to all your Absolutely arguments, right. particularly the, in your book, the, the Republican Workers' Party. It seems to me that the argument in favour of these changes hasn't necessarily been made in a way that would bring people on board, because you've got people on the left, Bernie, I'm thinking of the Bernie Sanders populists, for example, who actually agree on immigration and the impact of uncontrolled, low-wage right. immigration. Yeah. I mean, it's really a trifecta we want. It's, it's DACA and the wall but also the crazy 1965 immigration law. I mean, we have all sorts of weird stuff going on. We have 50,000 people admitted by virtue of a lottery. I mean, that's absolutely nonsense. We should be doing things like trying to admit skilled workers. And if that's thought to be right-wing in any way, heck, it is the Canadian system, for heaven's sakes. What, what's right-wing about that? That was what the Trump administration has always wanted, that trifecta. They were offered two parts of it a year ago with Chuck Schumer. Schumer said, you know, let's do the wall and let's do DACA now and we'll talk about the 65 Act later, which wasn't going to happen. But right now, I don't think Trump should do a deal which doesn't have part of a 65 Act as part of it. That's really interesting. What, what's your take on that, kid? A lot of people said that actually he should have gone for that deal. I think he's in a higher amount of money there, $25 billion, as I recall. I don't think Congress has the guts to do it. And, and I think they, they do need to take immigration apart, you know, whether it's from the 60s or the 80s under Presidents Reagan and Bush, and really figure out how amnesty uh, affected immigration in this country. Uh, you know, mostly, it, it was a, a net positive. I don't think they have the courage to do that. That's why I don't think we're going to see comprehensive of immigration reform. You're not going to see it because it's not popular with either party. And all both parties are doing right now is throwing money, trying to get votes because they're, we're in a moment of political desper desperation and it's so hyper-partisan and polarized that they, they can't come together mm -hmm. meaningfully on something big. So they're going to have to take it apart piecemeal. And that means if, right. if you've got two of the three things, if you've got DACA and you've got wall funding, then both sides should absolutely take it. Do you, but, do you agree with that, Lisa? Or do you think you should... Uh, the president should hold out for the full package that Frank was... Well, I, I think border security is the preeminent issue and the most important issue because, again, we are already cannot figure out what to do with the individuals living here illegally, mm -hmm. so we should stop the flow of additional legal immigration. But the big problem we're facing right now is with Central Americans seeking asylum, and they figured out how to yeah. game the system. We've seen 110 percent increase in males bringing a child with them in the last two years alone, and 89 percent of those individuals are going to pass their initial screening, uh, but only 9 percent are actually going to be granted asylum in court. So they've figured out how to get into the United States. Many of them don't even show up, and they become part of that 22 million a number of illegal immigrants living in the United well, this, States. So this is a serious problem that I needs totally to be addressed. I totally agree. And, and, and literally, for that reason, I don't understand why you can't make some kind of emergency situation out of it and just take the money from the trillions that are wasted on all sorts of other things. Anyway, got to leave it there. A populist uprising in France, Brexit under threat in the UK, and Angela Merkel on her way out in Germany. What does all this mean for us here in America? That's after the break.
In 1790, one of the most important documents in the history of conservatism was published, Edmund Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France. Burke criticised the revolutionaries for their focus on pompous, high-minded abstractions instead of practical measures to help actual people. Well, now the tables are turned. It's the president of France, Emmanuel Macron, who's wandering around the world, issuing high-minded proclamations, while the yellow vest revolutionaries on the streets of Paris are intensely practical. As one of the protesters pithily put it, we are overtaxed, but at the Elysee, that's the president's residence, they spend 10000 a month on the hairdresser. I don't know if President Macron's haircut is worth what's $11,000 a month, but the style he really should have is that of the original, out-of-touch French elitist Marie Antoinette. When told that the people couldn't afford bread, she famously said, let them eat cake. Guess what Macron said when French workers complained that his new gas tax meant they couldn't afford to get to work. He told them to carpool. What's going on in France is part of a worldwide populist uprising in the UK, in Germany, in Italy, in Eastern Europe, in Brazil, and, of course, here in America, with Donald Trump's election. And support for Bernie Sanders, let's remember. Working people are saying they've had enough of decades of elitist policies like uncontrolled immigration that help those at the top but hurt everyone else. But there's something else going on, too. The elitist fight back. In Britain, they're about to overturn Brexit. In Italy, the new populist government is about to have its budget rejected by the EU. And, of course, here in America, the establishment is doing everything it can to get Donald Trump out of office before the next election. Well, here's the takeaway from the chaos in France. If the elitist idiots think that Trump, Brexit and all these other populist movements are some kind of aberration and they can soon get back to business as usual, forget it. You can't treat working people with contempt and expect no consequences. There's a reason this show is called The Next Revolution. If the establishment overturned the Brexit vote or the 2016 presidential vote or any other of these votes, people are not going to passively take it. The revolution will continue. People will be on the streets. And no, President Macron, they won't get there in a carpool. Tell me what you think of that at Steve Hilton X and at Next Rev FNC. Frank, um, the populist movement, it, it's, people said when Brexit happened, oh, my God, this is sort of one-off, what, what's this all about? And then you had Trump. And then when Macron was elected, it was, oh, well, thank, the elites could relax. Um, it's over. The populist right. revolution is over. But then it's just continued in Germany with people rejecting Angela Merkel's immigration policies in Brazil, as I said, all over the place. But the elites still seem to me think that it's all a giant mistake Right. Well, let me not say good things about Louis XVI, but the point about Burke's point is the English do revolutions well, so do the Americans, but not the French. So there are limited messages we can take in any way from what's happening in Europe. We're different. We're Americans. But what I, I want you to address this point about the way in which the expressions of populist sentiment yeah. are viewed but by the, the, no, no one, it seems to me, in the elite has said, OK, what are they trying to tell us here? Should we re-examine the policies that actually have produced this discontent? Absolutely right. And, and if you know people in France, I mean, the level of comfortable corruption is quite extraordinary. I mean, there's nothing like it. I mean, much as you might rail about the swamp here, and with reason, there's nothing like France. I mean, it's just such a comfortable aristocracy. And the only way they have to react to it, I guess, is to take to the streets, right? And, but, you know, French revolutions tend not to turn out well. But, Kennedy, the, um, the, 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 the specific policy, like the, the, the practical aspects of this, the fact that the cost of living is so high, people aren't getting jobs, you know, those practical things that get, just get swept away by the elitist kind of, you know, we, we you know, the, do you remember Macron was talking about how nationalism is bad and, oh, and, yes, and so on? Oh, yes, of course. It just, with, the, it just, with really ill-defined terms, by the way. Exactly. And He and was I, making a, a circular argument without defining what he was talking about in the first place, which is not only incompetent, it's offensive, as you were. <laughs> and that's and they're exactly right. And they're still saying, well, you know, the, the, like, in, instead of it looking at themselves and saying, well, what did we do? that meant that people, for example, here in America, voted for President Trump. It's all just deflecting from that and then just attacking President Trump personally or the voters themselves, as Hillary Clinton keeps doing. Well, well and, and I go back to the letter that George H.W. Bush wrote for Bill Clinton. That was an incredibly contentious presidential election in 1992. And even with that, he, he felt someone who really was so 
far beneath the presidency, was duly elected, and he wrote him a letter saying, you're going to get a lot of criticism. It won't be for me. I am rooting for you. And, and could you imagine if we had that from someone like President Obama, instead of taking responsibility for the pendulum swinging in the completely opposite direction with voters turning towards someone who, who really was his polar opposite and Donald Trump? And that's the point of high taxes, and that's what you're seeing in France. Is mm -hmm. It's a form of social engineering. We're going to make your life so uncomfortable you will be forced to change your behavior. And people are standing up against that and saying, no, that is unjust. That is yes. not right. And, and we will not take that. But there's something else that's happening here. And, and there have been several news outlets pointing yeah. this out. Just as Russia made a big digital investment in disinformation in this country in our presidential election, they're doing the same thing in France and really fanning those flames because any sort of Western chaos right. benefits them. them. So that's an element Lisa? there. Well, I think in regards to populism in the United States, I think President Trump saw the fact that that a lot of these working class voters were ignored by the Democratic yeah. Party and President Obama in the seeking essentially identity politics. And a lot of these people felt left behind. President Trump was able to tap into that, the forgotten men and women. And that's what part of what fueled him uh, to victory in 2016, being able to identify that, see people in Macomb County and some of these counties that felt left behind by the Democrat Party. But I think in regard to France, what I find very interesting is obviously these um, individuals are rejecting the idea of an increased tax in the name of climate change. But what is also ironic is the United States that, you know, people like Macron thumb their, thumb their nose at the United States for President Trump pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord, not signing the communique at the G20 in regards to mm -hmm. climate change. But we're the ones that are leading the world in, in carbon oh, reductions. And because of the free market, because of, of the private sector and innovation point. technologically mm -hmm. um, in point. the energy space. And so I, I kind of find that to be a little bit hilarious it, uh, that, you know, we're the leader on it. It's, it's a great point. And I just want to add to what you said, though, Lisa, which is that it's not just the Democratic Party that gave the sense that it was leaving working people behind. The Republicans did, too. And that's part of Donald Trump's success. All right. Coming up, we'll meet the man with a new plan to break up big tech. Don't go away. We're going to Mitsubishi. Interested in a test drive? Yeah. yeah.
OK, so in tonight's Positive and Practical, we're looking at the monopolization of America's big tech companies and the economy generally, and one man's call to return to the aggressive antitrust enforcement this country hasn't seen since Teddy Roosevelt. Joining me now, author of The Curse of Bigness, Antitrust in the New Gilded Age, Tim Wu. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Great to see you. I'd love you just to sort of quickly tell us, um, what the, explain the two bits of that. Um, what is the curse of bigness and what is the new Gilded Age? The curse of bigness is simply the, the situation where you just have uh, too few companies controlling too many things, too few people in charge of too much media. You know, we, you were talking about big tech. Tech used to be an incredibly a, a, a competitive part of the economy and it's really gotten controlled by just a few big companies. And the new Gilded Age, I think, refers to right now. You were just talking about it earlier in the show, the idea that there's just a few elites who, who assume they are in charge of the country and, uh, and democracy be damned. So that, that's what the two ideas uh, are basically about in this book. So one of the things that people say, and I know you challenge it in the book, is that, well, you know, why should we care about this as long as people are getting stuff at, you know, cheap prices, in the case of some of the tech products, for, for free, basically. So what if, it, if it's all, you know, concentrated in terms of the markets, if, if consumers are getting a good deal? What's wrong with that? Well, I think consumers are really paying, uh, in a lot of ways, they're playing with their data, uh, they're, they're paying with their, uh, with their, their time and, and so forth, but also they're, they're paying with a sort of surrender of political control. You know, when, when you're only uh, uh, sort of delegating uh, Facebook to be, or, or Google or a few companies to be in control of what everybody sees and hears, you're, you're not quite in the sort of democracy that we, we imagined this country was meant to be. So that, that's what the way I think we really pay. We play in, in political terms. So one thing, I just want to talk now about the solution. So in, you, you, you specifically lay out a plan um, towards the end of your book on breaking up some of these big tech companies, Facebook, for example. Just tell us about that. Sure. So I, I, I think that, and I, I worked in antitrust enforcement, I think Facebook uh, uh, illegally uh, bought up many of its competitors in, in the 2010s. Uh, they bought up Instagram. They bought up WhatsApp. Not, maybe many uh, viewers might think they're separate companies, but they're all actually owned by the same company. And so I would simply reverse those mergers. Uh, they were illegal when they were done. I think they uh, continue to be illegal. And so you there have three competing social network companies, then maybe you'd see a little more, more privacy, um, you know, some different policies. I, I think we really need to sort of shake control away from just a couple big companies in Silicon Valley. Tim, thank you so much. I, 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 I really um, love your book. I think everyone should get it. Um, one thing I love about it is a short book. I'm, I mean that as a compliment. Um, uh, and so I appreciate what you're doing, your fight for all this. We're going to keep talking about it because it's really important. And thank you for joining us tonight. Appreciate it. Sure. Great pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. Um, Kennedy. Yes. We all, all should be in favor of competition. There yes. isn't enough competition. Do you think the government is really good at... at breaking up big companies. Uh, I disagree with the premise of the book. And in the 20th century, Tim Wu argues that nations that fail to control private power and attend to the needs of their citizens face the rise of strongmen who promised a more immediate deliverance from economic woes. Uh, that sounds very never Trump. It also sounds like it could have been written by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Hugo Chavez. Uh, I don't think that the state is the appropriate tool to be breaking up companies and deciding winners and losers. I don't like when the president but does you're, it. Hang on a second. But you're pro-market, right? You're, you're, you, you believe in markets. Yes. I also, I also take a more Randian view of antitrust issues. The big problem is crony capitalism, and that's big companies getting in bed with big government. Yeah. And that's a, a totally different premise than what Tim Wu was outlining in his book. Uh, what he's saying, like, this is a form of collectivism, and, and this is a form of statism, and the state knowing better than the individual, which is something that I inherently disagree with. Well, I think that it's clear that, uh, to me, that the, that the heart of, that, that actually, in many ways, antitrust enforcement can be the antidote to regulation in, in terms of micromanaging what companies do. If you have a competitive market, you shouldn't, don't need to worry about it so much. Well, I'll tell you the problem. The problem is you're asking one part of the swamp and the deepest part to cure the other part. Right. You're asking politicians to take it on. That's the problem. Uh, Wu was in the Obama Justice Department looking at antitrust issues. In 2012, uh, we might plausibly have gone after Facebook, but for the fact that Facebook at that point was proudly supporting the Obama re-election campaign. The likelihood that they were going to go after Facebook was approximately nil. I'll tell you the second problem. The second problem is, let's say they split up Facebook 
you know, half my friends in one and half the friends in the other. If you came back a year later, there'd just be one Facebook, right? Because it's something of a natural monopoly. Well, I think that there's things you can do, for example, forcing them to give the data out that would enable competitors to uh, step up. What's your take on all this? I mean, I think it's pretty terrifying just the sheer amount of power that companies like Facebook and Twitter and Google have. And you look at Facebook, nearly half of Americans get their news from Facebook. So their ability to control the content that Americans see or don't see is pretty terrifying. I think Congress is grappling with some of these issues. We've seen that when they've brought people like Zuckerberg before Congress uh, to grill him on a variety of issues. And I didn't know this, but I guess Trump had recently said, President Trump recently said in an interview that his administration is actually looking at Google, Amazon, and Twitter for potential antitrust violations. Well, so. I'm very glad to hear it. We've got to leave it there, I'm afraid. I, for me, this issue of a lack of competition throughout the economy is a huge part of this whole populist argument because it ends up hurting workers as well as society generally. Anyway, we've got to leave it there. Coming up, a member of President Trump's cabinet under fire for getting a sweetheart deal for a billionaire child molester. Swamp Watch brings you the shocking facts next.
Last week, we told you about a number of officials in the Trump administration working to undermine the president's drain the swamp agenda. But new details about a truly outrageous criminal case reveal that the Secretary of Labor deserves an investigation all to himself. Alexander Acosta is tonight's Swamp Watch. A fantastic piece of in-depth reporting by the Miami Herald has revealed shocking new details about a 2008 plea deal that Alexander Acosta, then U.S. attorney in Miami, offered billionaire hedge fund manager and serial sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein was a money manager for the wealthiest elites in the country. He owned two private jets, the largest single residence in Manhattan, an island in the Caribbean, a ranch in New Mexico, and a waterfront estate in Florida. His friends include people like Donald Trump, Bill Clinton, and Britain's Duke of York, Prince Andrew. But behind the scenes, Epstein was running a horrific, pyramid-like, underage sex scheme, offering $200 to impoverished and troubled 14- to 17-year-old girls to come to his home and give him massages. Once they got there, he offered more money for increasingly vile and exploitative sexual acts and also paid them to recruit other young girls. An FBI investigation revealed what the Herald calls a sprawling network of victims and an abundance of physical evidence and witness testimony, including notepads seized from Epstein's home with some of the girls' names and phone numbers. The FBI had enough material to produce a 50-page indictment with federal sex crime charges that could have put Epstein in prison for life. So, what was his sentence? Unbelievably, this evil pedophile monster served just 13 months in a county jail for his crimes. And it gets worse. In those pathetic 13 months, Epstein's so-called cell was a private space in a vacant wing of the jail. And he was allowed out to work 12 hours a day, six days a week in his fancy office, despite the county sheriff's department rules explicitly forbidding sex offenders from qualifying for work release. Then, after his sentence, Epstein reportedly traveled extensively, even receiving permission to visit his private Caribbean island. An exceptional privilege for a felon on probation. So, how did Epstein get away with all this? That's where Alexander Acosta comes in. As the local US attorney, it was his job to prosecute the case. But Epstein had a powerful list of lawyers on his side, including Harvard professor Alan Dershowitz, former Whitewater independent counsel Kenneth Starr, and Jay Lefkowitz, who just happened to be Acosta's former co-worker at the well-known Washington law firm Kirkland & Ellis. So, Lefkowitz scheduled a meeting with his old colleague, Acosta, to discuss Epstein's case. They reportedly met for breakfast at the Marriott Hotel in West Palm Beach. As a result of that meeting, Lefkowitz walked away with an extraordinary plea deal that not only led to Epstein's outrageous 13-month jail sentence, but also included a non-prosecution agreement that effectively shut down an ongoing FBI probe into whether there were more victims of Epstein's depravity. The deal required Epstein to plead guilty to just two prostitution charges in state court. Beyond vastly understating his crimes, those charges are blatantly ridiculous given that his crimes were against minors who by law can't consent to sex and thus can't be prostitutes. Epstein was required to register as a sex offender and pay restitution to the three dozen victims identified by the FBI. But in exchange, he and four of his accomplices, whose identities are still hidden, received immunity from all federal criminal charges. And as part of the arrangement, Acosta agreed that the deal would be kept secret from the victims who are calling for justice against Epstein. The Herald's investigation also found that Acosta and his team actually helped keep the case quiet. One email from Acosta's fellow prosecutor, Marie Villafana, to Epstein's lawyer read, quote, on an avoid the press note, I can file the charge in district court in Miami, which will hopefully cut the press coverage significantly. Do you want to check that out? What? It is absolutely shameful that Acosta and his team bent over backwards, not just to reduce Epstein's sentence to practically nothing, but to hush the whole thing up. Have you ever seen a more sickening example of the elite looking after its own? Quite rightly, a number of lawmakers are now calling for an investigation into all this by the Justice Department Inspector General. The Labour Secretary himself has refused to comment, but back in 2011, he did write a to whom it may concern letter in response to outrage over the deal. In it, he says, 
our judgment in this case, based on the evidence known at the time, was that it was, a, it was better to have a billionaire serve time in jail, register as a sex offender and pay his victims restitution, than risk a trial with a reduced likelihood of success. See what he did there? He's basically saying, guys, this is a billionaire we're talking about. You're lucky he got any punishment at all. What an outrage. He's admitting that there's one law for the rich and one for everyone else. That's not good enough, Alexander Acosta. You helped cover up a billionaire's pedophile sex crimes on an epic scale. Now you're in President Trump's cabinet. And I think you owe all of us an explanation and an apology. And if you can't do that, it's time for you to go. Tell us what you think of this story at Steve Hilton X and at Next Rev FNC. Coming up, the latest on the massive shakeups at the White House. Who's out today? Find out after the break.